welcome to the 40 day journey um we've been away for a long time i know that and sincere apologies on our part but we remember saying um from time to time when urgent things come our way emergencies priorities we will give a break and then we will come back so it's a promise we made we're gonna finish this 40 days so that's why we're back and remember what we're doing is the purpose driven life by rick warren and the question was what on earth am i here for so let's delve straight into it um there's no live program there's no inter instagram and all that we're just purely recording for youtube so again thank you so much for all the people who's been part of this program we absolutely appreciate you and we appreciate all our subscribers for being there with us more things will be coming your way so today's chapter is chapter 33 and it is day 33 so we're nearly getting there it says how real servants act that's the title how real servants act whoever wants to be great must become a servant so that's the big message here whoever wants to be great in this world will start by being a servant so we serve god by serving others and invariably serve ourselves so when we serve god we actually we start by serving others so we serve others means we're serving god but when we do that we end up serving ourselves so that's a message i want us to start thinking about because we don't tend to do that and that's what this chapter is about the world demands greatness in terms of power, possessions, prestige, and position. So if you can demand service from others, you've arrived. So that's the way the world sees it. But in our self-serving culture, with its me-first mentality, acting like a servant is not a popular concept. So all of us just want to be superstars. We all want to be on top of the game nobody wants to be below and so jesus measures greatness in terms of service not status but right now all we think about is status he says god determines your greatness by how many people you serve not how many people serve you so god really is looking at us based on how we can serve other people not how many people can serve us because that's the position we're in as people we generally want the world to serve us but we forget that greatness actually comes from us serving people and so this is contrary to the world's idea of greatness that we have a hard time understanding it much less practicing it so the world's idea of greatness is we get served how many servants do we have and as a Nigerian I can relate to this so much all we want to be done or people do to us is serve us everyone back home want to be called sir and madam okay is a typical culture sometimes in some countries but it's not sir and madam in the sense of you just say the word sir it's in the sense of you're subservient to that person and so the disciples, the disciples argued about who deserved the most prominent position. And 2,000 years later, society is still fighting for prominence and positions. Remember there was that story when the disciples was asking Jesus, so among us, who will be the greatest? And Jesus said, there's no such thing as the greatest. But what he is trying to explain to us, Rick is this thing is still here with us. We still are so conscious about how great we are. So thousands of books have been written on leadership, but few on servant, servanthood. So everybody that wants to write a book on oh, how to be a great leader, how to be, so it's always about leading, leading, leading. No one's ever talked about how to be a great servant, someone who serves people. 
He said, everyone wants to lead and no one wants to be a servant. We would rather be generals than privates. You know, in the army, general, this person, general, that person. No one wants to be this private person. So to be like Jesus is to be a servant. So this is where the Christian view comes into play. Because most times when people talk about Christianity, I always say to me or to myself, it's not just about a doctrine. It's about acting like Jesus Christ. Because that's what it's about. Christianity, you are a follower of Christ. That's Christianity. So if you are saying to yourself, you are a Christian, can you act like Jesus? Christ-like. But that's where this chapter is trying to remind us that even we Christians are struggling to understand that big message of being a servant, of serving the people. Because all of us want to be leaders. While knowing your shape is important for serving God, Having the heart, of a, the heart of a servant is even more important. Remember God shaped you for service, not for self-centeredness. Without a servant's heart, you will be tempted to misuse your shape for personal gain. So whatever you've been created for is not for you to worry, just focus on you, self-centeredness. It's all about me. Without the seven time, we will be tempted to misuse our shape for personal gains. You will also be tempted to use it as an excuse to exempt yourself from meeting some needs. God often tests our hearts by asking us to serve in ways we are not shaped for. And if you recall, we did talk about shape, shape, shape in previous chapters. So ways that we are not shaped for, meaning the things that are not who we are. So he tempts us. So if you see a man fall into a ditch, God expects us to help him out, not to say, I don't have the gift of mercy or service. While you may not be gifted for a particular task, you may be called to do it if no one gifted at it is around. So this man falls into the ditch, you don't say, Oh, I haven't, I haven't been gifted with this heart of mercy. So I'm not going to be able to pick the man up. But it says, that has nothing to do with it. Because you're here and now. You are in that position to help this man up. He said, your primary ministry is, should be in the area of your shape. Yes. But your secondary service is in whatever you needed at that moment. At that moment when this man is in the ditch, your secondary ministry is help him out. Get him out of the ditch. Your shape reveals your ministry. But your servant's heart will reveal your maturity. So being able to serve people is about maturity. No special talent or gift is required to stay after a meeting to pick up the trash clean the tables or stack up chairs. So if you find yourself somewhere, example, there was a meeting, you attended a meeting, the meeting is over. Are you one of those people who just carry your bag and walk off? Or are you one of those people who just stay back and say, oh look, the table is a bit messy, let's clear up, let's pack the chairs, let's make this place as it was before we had the meeting. Are you one of those people? Because these are the things the questions are about. It's about, are you an impromptu person? Are you someone who on the spot knows what to do when you have to do it? Or are you one of those people who want a script to be written for you and say, when you are out, this is how you behave, this is how you do things. You're not on the spot ready to deal with things as they happen. So, anyone can be a servant. All it requires is character. Do you have that character that will just see something that needs to be done and you do it? Or do you have the character that waits until you're instructed? It is possible to serve in life without ever being a servant. 
and in this instance is trying to break it apart where we think in our head a servant is someone who is always subservient but it says you can be of service that's the way I like to understand it you can be of service without necessarily being this servant person so you must have a servant's heart and I just thought you know what you could you could actually be out there with it by saying here I'm, I am here to serve you so because if you start understanding what he's talking about in this action of service you find that even in your business you can operate on this you can start looking at your clients and say I am here for a purpose to serve you because some of us set up businesses and all we think about is we're the boss of this business and so we don't see the client as someone who is there to offer you something well you give them something we don't remember that we need to satisfy them for them to continue to patronize us so if you're serving people will be happy with you and so if you say how can I help and you're always willing to help it, it, be, it becomes clearer that you are of service to people but it says how can you know if you have the heart of a servant and Jesus said you can tell what they are by what they do so oftentimes no one needs to tell you who they are just watch what they do and he starts to break it down. Real servants make themselves available to serve. So this is one of the characters. This is one of the qualities that makes you a servant. You make yourself available. Servants don't fill up their time with other pursuits that could limit their availability. They want to be ready to jump into service when they are called upon. Much like a soldier, a servant must always be standing for duty. So whenever the need arises for you to get on and be there or, or, or be of service to people, be ready to do it. It's like I've committed myself to bring this program to you for these 40 days. Whenever the opportunity arises, I pull time together and I do it. Because that's what service is about. Much like a soldier, a servant must always be standing for duty. No soldier is in, in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the other and the one who enlisted him. So you're always available, ready, and you end up pleasing the person who put you on that duty. And who could be the person that put us on this duty of service? It's our God. So if we don't make ourselves available to serve people around us, we are not making ourselves available for duty. If you only serve when it is convenient for you, you're not a real servant. So if only you do things only when it's okay, then you're not a real servant. You should do things sometimes even when it's so uncomfortable. Like the time right now, by my time, is nearly um, 11 o'clock. But I'm happy to sit here and get this message across. And that's what service is. Even when it's uncomfortable for you. Real servants do what's needed. Even when it's inconvenient. Are you available to, to God anytime? Question. Can he mess up your plans without you becoming resentful? Can things completely go out of normal for you? You had planned your day, you had planned things the way they should have been, and something out of the ordinary happens that you have to offer service, and you get so wound up. Why did this happen now? I already had my day planned out. Then you, you don't have the heart of service. As a servant, you don't get to pick and choose when and where you will serve. You don't do that. Being a servant means giving up the right to control your schedule and allowing God to interrupt him whenever he needs to. If you will remind yourself at the start of every day that you are God's servant, interruptions won't frustrate you as much. Because, yes, 
Life is full of it. Life is so full of interruptions. I mean, for instance, today, I got up and I was ready. I decided I'm going to take on this chapter and I'm going to read it and I'll be ready to discuss this and chat with you about this. And then I had such an eventful day. All kinds of interruptions just came into play. I had to make some calls. I had to, you know, attend to issues. I had to look for documents. And by the time I was done, I was drained of energy. But I told myself I had promised to make this today. And I came right back to it. That's what being a servant is like. Interruptions, yes, they will come in your life. If you will remind yourself at the start of every day that you are God's servant, interruptions won't frustrate you as much. Because your agenda will be whatever God wants to bring into your life. And I agree with that. Because my agenda today wasn't what I planned. Someone see interruptions as divine appointments for ministry and are happy for the opportunity to practice serving. So, a servant will see every interruption as divine appointments. It's like, okay, it's happened, it's out of my control, so be it. And that was the attitude I had with the things I had to deal with today. I had to clean up my head and I said, you know what? I'll just leave it with you, God. Because there must be a reason these things are happening. And you know best. So, real servants pay attention to needs, and that's the next, the next thing that real servants do. Servants are always on the lookout for ways to help others. So whenever there's an opportunity to help others, servants are always happy to help. When they see a need, they see the woman to meet, to meet it. When God puts someone in need right in front of you, he is giving you the opportunity to grow in servanthood and I know I do try I've had opportunities recently where I had to help people do things because they didn't know how to do it and I was more than happy to help because for me it's just I don't know I just enjoy helping and I always say to everyone around me if you need my help in any form please feel free to call me if it's something I can do I will do it that's what servanthood is all about. Be happy to help people whenever they are in your presence and they seek help. We miss many occasions to serve because we lack sensitivity and spontaneity. Lots of us are not spontaneous. We, we always wait for a script to be written. Spontaneity is on the spot. Something just happened, deal with it. Great opportunities to serve never last long. So when opportunities like that come, they don't linger on for too long. They just come and go. And so the big message after this chapter today is start watching out for opportunities to serve others. Because each time you serve others, you're actually serving God. He put you there for a reason. They pass quickly, sometimes never to return again. That opportunity that was going to make you be of service may not return again. You may only get one chance to serve that person. So take advantage of the moment. Never tell anyone to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. John Wesley, an incredible servant of God, had this, this motto. Do all the good you can. By all the means you can, in all the ways you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. And that was his motto. All the things you can, whenever you can, at all the times, you know, it's all about you being able to do it at that moment. And that is greatness. You can begin by looking for small tasks that no one else wants to do. So those small little things around you, no one wants to do it. Take it on and do it. 
do these little things as if they were great things because God is watching. And so that was the second one. So the third one, real servants do their best with what they have. They do their best with what they have. Servants don't make excuses. They don't procrastinate or wait for better circumstances. Oh yeah, let me wait until the right time, until it is okay, until it is convenient, until, you know, that's not what servants do. They don't wait for that. Servants never say, one of these days, or when the time is right. They just do what needs to be done. That's what servants do. The Bible says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. So if you went for perfect conditions, you never get anything done. And, and this applies to everything else we do in life as well. You know, like when you want to start a business and most people always say, until it's right. Let me have all the right money. Let me have all the right environment. Let me have all the right ideas in my head. Let it be right before. No, there's no such thing. You learn every day. Every day is a school in life. Every day is life's school. That's what I say to everyone. Because the things that happen to you on a daily basis, you've never experienced them before. And so it all becomes part of your experience. And that's what makes life. Life is just continuous experience. And so if you go into business and you're waiting for that right moment, it will not work. And so the same thing here with being of service to people. Don't wait until it is the right moment. Then you can be of service to people. The Bible says if you wait for that perfect condition, it will never get, you will never get it. God expects you to do what you can with what you have, wherever you are. What you can with whatever you have. So that's what it is. What you can with what you have. Less than perfect service is always better than the best intention. So, yeah, you did your best at that moment. That's what it is. One reason many people never serve is that they fear they are not good enough to serve. So some people think, oh, no, I'm not good enough until I am this way and that way and that way. No. They have believed the lie that serving God is only for superstars. I found this one really interesting because of course there are those celebrity preachers who come across like oh yeah you cannot be a preacher until that's not what it should be this makes people of average talent hope you know hesitate to get involved so ordinary people go no 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 I can't do this because I'm not that celebrity preacher I'm not that superstar preacher and so you cannot help people who need help you may have heard people say, if it can't be done with excellence, don't do it. Some people say that. But the truth is, almost everything we do is done poorly when we first start doing it. And that's how we learn. So that was the big message again. Remember I mentioned that even in business, people think until it's perfect. He says, no. Every time we do something for the first time, it will be wrong. It will be very poor. You know, I always show you the training pack with our video, I mean our hair, hair service and our hair training here. First times the students start learning how to braid. It's never good. It's never. And that's why you're here. That's why you've come to learn. Because you don't know how to do it. And that's what we will try to perfect. That's what we'll put in every effort to guide you. That's what life is about. First time you're doing anything it will never be right. And so you keep doing it and it starts getting better. So the same thing with service. First time you're trying to be of service to people, you may wonder if you're doing the right thing. So he says, real servants do every task with equal dedication. So everything they're doing, the same zeal comes true. You don't pick and choose. Today I'm going to be so nice with this one. And next time, no, I'm not going to be good enough. 
So whatever they do, servants do it with all their heart. Whatever. And I always say to everyone around me, it's like, you better do it with all your heart or don't do it at all. And it doesn't matter what this is. Like my kids, they're trying to do the dishes. Put your heart in it. And I say to them, try and love what I'm doing the dishes. You should see my young son, he gets so irritated. Doing dishes, and I love dishes. Mom, it's never going to happen. I said, but if you don't love it, you're going to keep hating it. So whatever you're doing, love it. And that's where the dedication comes in. So if you're doing it with dedication, you're going to find that it gets easier and easier. It gets more and more interesting. Irrelevant. The only issue is, does it need to be done? Does that thing need to be done? If it needs to be done, do it. You will never arrive at the same state in life where you are, where you are, where you are too important to help with mental tax. So if you think, oh yeah, I'm not ever going to be in a position to help people. So you're never going to arrive where you are today if you felt you were too good to get things done. God will never exempt you from the mundane. So, you know, the things that you call mundane, no, this is too ordinary for me. No, 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 I need something special to do. No, it does not exempt anyone. Every one of us must go through mundane tasks. Example, doing dishes. Which I said to my kids, I said, you're never going to run away from doing dishes in life. It's just part of life. Oh, yeah, I'm going to make sure I have all the washing dishwashers and everything but they could pack up and if they do what happens oh, i'm gonna have lots of servants okay you may not be able to afford them and so why can you just take on this and then if situations arrive in future where things are different you go okay i can i know how to do it it's just that i'm busy doing something else so it just goes to show that nothing should be seen as ordinary or mundane as he puts it god will never exempt you from mundane it is a vital part of your character curriculum it helps to build you up to deal with the smallest of tax so that you can also handle the bigger tax and i know so many people that all they say oh i only look at the big picture but you forget that the small picture end up making the big picture you cannot get to the big picture if you don't start with the small picture. And so that's what this message is trying to teach us to. Don't see anything as ordinary or mundane. They all add up. Bible says if you think you are too important to help someone in need, you're only fooling yourself. You are really a nobody. All of us really are nobodies. Because look at when it's over, it's just, it's just over. So why do we attach so much Im image onto ourselves and believe that we're too good for some people? It is these small services that we grow. It is in these small services that we start to grow like Jesus Christ. Jesus specialized in menial tasks that everyone else tried to avoid. And he starts to give us examples. Washing feet. Remember Jesus washing um, uh, somebody's feet? Helping children. He was always there for children. Fixing breakfast. Serving lepers. So all this role, Jesus did that. And especially for those of us who call ourselves Christians. We are supposed to be following Christ. Christ-like. And suddenly we can't do mundane tasks. I mean, especially the celebrity preachers. Who put on their most amazing outfits and jet off in their uh, um, uh, private jets and don't even get me started and they take money from the poor and create this wealth i mean i got some instagram posts and they're talking about all the schools this is example of nigeria these schools that all these churches have put together expensive schools the money that created those schools come from these poor worshippers. 
and now they can't even send their children to those schools. How fair is that? And then you tell yourself you're of service. That is not service. That's just business. And now that you turn your idea of Christianity, which is now a business, and you tell them you they are worshiping God, and every day you keep coming back and asking them to give you more money. I don't get it. But that's what these stories, I mean, what this man is telling us in this book. We should learn to serve. If we say we're Christians, we should learn to behave like Jesus Christ. Washing feet, having children, fixing breakfast, serving lepers, raising the dead. He was doing everything that other people would think is too mundane for them. Nothing was beneath him because he came to serve. It wasn't in spite of his greatness that he did these things, but because of it. And he expects us to follow his example. Small tasks often, often show a big heart. So if you're willing, if you're willing, you're happy to take on small tasks, it just shows that you have a really big heart. Your servant's heart is revealed in little acts that others don't think of doing. So, you've been able to take on the smallest of tasks. I mean, reading this chapter just opened my eyes to things that even I didn't know. So, there will always be more people willing to do great things for God than there are people willing to do the little things. So... It's about picking up something to do for God, not waiting until it's great. The race to be a leader is crowded, but the field is open for those willing to be servants. So everyone is chasing that road, wanting to be the leader of whoever. Everyone wants to lead everyone, but no one wants to serve anyone. So that's where the problem is. That road to become leaders is so crowded, while the road to become servants, there's nobody there. So, sometimes you serve upward to those in authority, and sometimes you serve downwards to those in need. So these are tasks we should take on. Sometimes we should be willing to look up, do what needs to be done up, and come down and do what needs to be done down. You should be willing to be available to people, whichever direction. And not just stick yourself up and say, that's it, I don't talk to people down. Either way, you develop a servant's heart when you're willing to do anything needed. And so he says the next one, real servants are faithful to their ministry. Servants finish their task, fulfill their responsibilities, Keep their promises and complete their commitment. Very important. They do all they need to do to keep things going. So they don't leave their job half done and they don't quit when they get discouraged. That's real servants. They are trustworthy and they're dependable. Their faithfulness has always been a rare quality. But servants have it. Most people don't know the meaning of commitment. They make commitment casually, then break them for the slightest reasons, without any hesitation, remorse, or regret. Can you be counted on by others? That's the question he's asking us. Can you be counted on? Can you can you say any word to people and that say it's connected you, it's bound you? Can your word be your bound? Like you say it and then you mean it and then you're going to act it out? Are there promises you need to keep, vows you need to fulfill, or commitments you need to honor? This is a test. God is testing your faithfulness. If you pass the test, you are in good company. He gave examples. Abraham, Moses, Samuel, David, Daniel, Timothy, Paul were all faithful servants of God. Faithful servants never retire. They serve faithfully as long as they are alive. 
So whenever called upon by God, so faithful servants will be there, ready to do what God wants them to do. So he says, real servants maintain a low profile. Servants don't promote or call attention to themselves. Look at me here. I'm a servant. Look at what I'm doing today. He says, instead of acting to impress and dressing for success, they put on the apron of humility to serve one another. If recognized for their service, they humbly accept it. But they don't allow notoriety to distract them from their work. Paul exposed this. A kind of service that appears to be spiritual, but it's just a put on. A show. An act to get attention. And Paul calls it eye service. People who just seek attention. Whenever they're doing anything, they want the whole world to know that they're doing it. He says that's eye service. Serving in order to impress people with how spiritual we are. So you give the picture, I'm so spiritual and you're serving to impress people. But that's not what it should be. They don't seek attention. They do it quietly. Self-promotion and servanthood don't mix. Real servants don't serve for approval or applause of others. You don't serve just so that people can clap hands for you and praise you and give you awards. They live for an audience of God. So you serve because the spirit in you insisted you should do something. And you do it. You do it quietly. Don't do a sing and dance, you know, they say, sing and dance about it. Paul says this, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. So for him, he chose to serve God, not because men asked him to, or he was trying to please other people. I think rather it's difficult these days to even tell people, I'm a Christian, they just look at you funny. Because most people don't want to hear the word. And so Christian, Christianity is not to please people. You do it because it's a calling inside you. You won't find many real servants in the limelight. In fact, they avoid it when possible. They are content with quietly serving in the shadows. And he gave Joseph as a good example. He quietly served Potiphar, the man whose wife accused him and he eventually got jailed. He served Pharaoh's baker and wine tester while he was in prison. Because when they had the dreams and they didn't know who go tell them what it meant, he told them. He got promoted to prominence where he still maintained his servant's heart even when his brothers who betrayed him came over. That was Joseph. He got all the attention but he didn't ask for it. Unfortunately, many leaders today start off as servants but end up turning themselves as celebrities. This always happens especially in churches. When they're starting the little church, they're being all nice to everyone, everyone supports them, be part of them, and then they make money riding on top of the people. And then now, the people cannot access them anymore. Many leaders so they start off like that. They become addicted to attention. You know, like, you know the way the celebrities are, they just love the attention. And the minute they are, the line lamp goes off them, they find another way to get back. Unaware that, um, that always being in the spotlight blinds you. So he says they become addicted to attention, but they are unaware that always being in the spotlight blinds you. So when you're constantly seeking attention, constantly being in the limelight, that huge light that is the limelight blinds you because you obviously can't see. You can see in the sense of whatever it is gets into your head, you become addicted to it. And now it's like no one can tell you anything. 
you're only answerable to yourself. You may be serving in obscurity, feeling unknown and feeling unappreciated. God put you there for a purpose. So don't feel bad. Just carry on doing what you have to do. He has every hair on your head counted. And that gives you so much solace sometimes when things get so bad and you feel, oh my goodness, I don't know what could have cost me all this grief. And then I remember, God is in control. He has every hair on our heads counted. So he says, stay put until he chooses to move you. He will let you know if he wants you somewhere else. So whatever role you're playing now to help and support people, keep doing it. God knows why you're there. Neutrality means nothing to real servants because they know the difference between prominence and significance. There's a difference between both of them. Keep on serving God. Throw yourselves into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of effort. Nothing you do for God is a waste of effort. Jesus said, if as my representatives, you give even a cup of cold water to a little child, you will surely be rewarded. So that's the end of our chapter. And as usual, you know, our little notes, it says points to remember. I serve God by serving others. That's a big point. So each time you're serving people, remember we talked about it, you're actually serving God. And the verse to remember, if you give even a cup of cold water, sorry, how to young. If you give even a cup of cold water to one of the list of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. That's Jesus talking to us. And this was in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. And the question we should ask ourselves, which of these six characteristics of we servants offer the greatest challenge to us? And so remember we talked about six major things. Which one of them offers you so much challenge? Which one do you think, oh, I struggle with that one? It's about overcoming the challenge. That's what it is. And so, we've come to the end of this chapter, and I say, God bless you abundantly. Continue to lead us in everything we do. Continue to remind us that every hair on our head has been counted for by God, and our purpose here is for a bigger mission than what we are thinking. It's not about being a leader. It's about being able to serve everyone. See you in the next chapter. God bless you abundantly.